Tonight at 10, Jeremy Corbyn lays the foundations of Labour's election campaign with strong criticism of the wealthy elite. At the formal campaign launch in Trafford, he said that a Labour government would change a system that was rigged for the rich. When Labour wins, there'll be a reckoning for those who thought they could get away with assets stripping our industry, crashing our economy through their greed and ripping off workers and consumers. But later in the day's campaigning, Mr Corbyn was accused of throwing Labour's Brexit policy into confusion. If you're Prime Minister, we will leave whatever happens. I don't know any more than you do exactly what is going to happen in the future on, on this. We'll have more from that interview and we'll have reaction to today's launch. Also tonight, energy companies don't like the new Conservative plan to cap domestic bills and Theresa May denies that she's just copied an old Labour policy. Too many ordinary working families, too many vulnerable people find themselves on tariffs that are above that that they should be paying. A British man is jailed by a court in Turkey. He's found guilty of being a member of so-called Islamic State. A young girl has died in an accident on a ride at a theme park in Staffordshire. And a visit to Venice to see the work of a British artist who waited decades for global recognition. And coming up in Sports Day on BBC News... Good evening. Jeremy Corbyn has laid the foundations of Labour's election campaign with a relentless attack on greedy bankers, tax cheats and employers who rip off their workers. The party's formal campaign launch in Trafford, Mr Corbyn presented Labour as the anti-establishment choice. But he was also accused of throwing Labour's Brexit policy into confusion by repeatedly refusing to confirm that Britain would be leaving the EU if Labour won the election. Mr Corbyn is speaking to our political editor, Laura Kunzberg, who reports now on the day's events. Jeremy Corbyn! A showbiz introduction. Labour's had more drama in 18 months than some parties do in a decade. But he is on the main stage now. So are you ready for his lines? The economy is still rigged in favour of the rich and powerful. When Labour wins, there'll be a reckoning for those who thought they could get away with assets stripping our industry, crashing our economy through their greed and ripping off workers and consumers. A dramatic call in front of his shiny new battle bus. But since he's been in charge, Labour has gone backwards. We have four weeks to ruin their party. We have four weeks to have a chance to take our wealth back. We must seize that chance today and every day until June the 8th. He's brought multitudes of new members, but what about the mainstream? You said rather dramatically, there will be a reckoning if you become Prime Minister. Now, a reckoning doesn't sound like a few people at the very top paying a little bit more. It sounds like something rather more radical. What Much it is, higher taxes for business. It's a reckoning in our society that uh, very big business uh, should pay more in tax. Corporation tax should not be lowered as the Conservatives have proposed to give away more than 60 billion in tax cuts so over the next four years. So how much more would you put Well, on you'll have to wait for the manifesto for <laughs> the details. You that. That. You're, you're expecting that answer, I know. When you use language like promising a reckoning, talking about people taking back their wealth, to some voters, to some of our viewers, that sounds like the politics of envy? Not at all, not at all. What I'm saying is that uh, we all benefit when we all do better. We are a very rich country but unfortunately the riches are not very fairly spread around the place and uh, the levels of inequality are getting worse. We need to understand the anger that many people feel in this country. Six million earning less than the living wage, a million on zero hours contracts, many on short-term jobs and short-term working in communities that have seen precious little investment for 30 years. Their anger is palpable and real. And are you angry? Yes. I do get angry about poverty, I get angry about injustice, I get angry about inequality. Why do you believe that you can now win a general election from the left? Because the evidence so far under your leadership 
is that the kind of things that you've been saying, which are all the evidence like a storm is in a room like this, but the evidence is in the wider electorate that the Labour Party has been going backwards. All the evidence is ask people the question on wages, ask people the question on housing, ask people the question on education, ask people the question on social care. Ask them all those questions, all of which are framed in our policies, and you find people saying, yeah, I agree with that. That's what he wants to take on the road, with big promises to come. Voters in Salford Sunshine were curious. I don't know if he, necessarily the, he is necessarily the individual, but certainly where he's coming from, I think it really resonates with, with so many people sort of up here and in other parts of the country. There's not many people in the Labour Party hate him. Oh, I won't say hate him, but can't, uh, can't get on with him. I don't know, I don't, I don't think he got much of a chance. The class sizes. But it's been hard for Labour to settle on a position on leaving the EU. The leader wants to draw a line. This election isn't about Brexit itself. That issue has been settled. The question now is what sort of Brexit do we want? And what sort of country do we want Britain to be after that? His aides are adamant settled means settled. A Labour government would leave. But when I asked him several times, the answer was not quite so clear. Does that mean if you're a Prime Minister, come hell or high water, whatever the deal on the table, we will be leaving the European Union? Look, there was a clear vote of the referendum a year ago, but there is now the negotiations which have already begun. But that's not quite my question. My question is, if you're Prime Minister, we will leave come hell or high water, whatever is on the table at the end of the negotiations. We win the election, we'll get a good deal with Europe. Can you categorically say that we would definitely leave? Because if you won't, there is a, a chink of a possibility that things could change and we, we might end up looking differently at our options. The danger is of the approach the Conservatives are taking in their megaphone diplomacy with Europe. Our view is you have to talk to them, negotiate with them and recognise there is actually quite a lot of common interest, particularly in manufacturing industry. That is the process we're following. But for all the leaders in this merry dance, every word, every move does matter. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Trafford. Staying with the election campaign and the energy industry is unhappy with Theresa May's new policy of proposing a cap on domestic fuel bills if the Conservatives win the election. One of the big suppliers, E.ON, said it was concerned that the idea was being proposed for political reasons. Mrs May said it was part of her efforts to support working families and she denied that she was simply copying an old Labour policy which David Cameron had once described as Marxist. Our deputy political editor, John Pienaar, has more details. Election pledges don't get closer to home. Today's big offer, a promise from Theresa May to cap your fuel bills, the standard tariff paid by millions if they're judged too high. Energy firms don't like it. Labour say it was their idea. But this Tory campaign is about her, her team, her way. Policies like capping energy prices to support working families. Some Tories, some ministers had doubted this meddling in the market, but she's the boss. And one report had said the big six energy firms charged 1.4 billion over the odds in a year. I think in those circumstances it's right, as does everybody sitting around the cabinet table, for government to take action to support working families. And later to factory workers in Leeds, she admitted she was running against classic Tory thinking. Sometimes people say to me that doing something like that doesn't sound very conservative, but actually my response to that is when it comes to looking at uh, supporting working people, what matters is not an ideology, what matters is doing what you believe to be right. But remember him and this? If we win that election in 2015, the next Labour government will freeze gas and electricity prices until the start of 2017. Ed Miliband promised a price freeze and Labour was also willing to let prices fall. The reaction today has been anything but the same. Approval from Tory-leaning papers compared to outrage when Labour promised almost the same thing. If they were going to copy my idea, Theresa May should have done a much better job of it than she's done. Because looking at the detail and the fine print, they're not guaranteeing that there won't be a rise in prices, as we did. They're saying somebody else has got to make that judgment. So she certainly can't be promising money off bills or even uh, actually that prices won't carry on going up. Well, it's good politics because it sounds great, 
but it's rubbish policy because it'll actually lead to less investment and higher prices. So it'll harm and damage the very people, those on low incomes, that it's supposed to be helping. Some ministers may have had their doubts, but as one cabinet member put it to me, Theresa May's ideology is not to have one. She's out to show people who feel they're getting a raw deal that she's on their side. So sometimes she sounds right wing on migration, on Brexit, but on some pieces of policy, like this latest piece of intervention, she leans to the centre. Theresa May's after votes from every political direction. Forget the polls, no one's voted. She's campaigning as if the result's on a knife edge and she's fighting to win and win big. John Pienaar, BBC News, Westminster. Well, as we said, some of the biggest names in the energy uh, business have been criticising the plans to cap prices, arguing that the move would stifle competition and hurt consumers. Our business editor, Simon Jack, is here to look at what effect that price cap could have. Simon? Hugh, thank you. There's a stubborn problem in this market. It's that people could pay less if they shopped around, but for many reasons they don't, and end up paying far too much. Two-thirds of people, that is 17 million households, are still on the standard tariff. That's usually the most expensive. People like the Broughtons. Adam and Margaret Broughton from Eccles near Manchester have been with the same supplier for 30 years. So why haven't they switched? It's just impossible to compare like with like because the, the tariffs are also confusing, deliberately so, you know, so that people just can't make an informed choice. After about two hours ploughing through, I just gave up and thought, it's better the devil I know, get a bill, go and pay it at the bank, I know I've paid it. Now, competition authorities reckon the non-switchers are collectively being overcharged £1.4 billion. The Tories think a cap could save them up to £100 per household per year, something consumer protection groups broadly welcome today. The energy market's clearly not working. Too many people are stuck on standard variable tariffs, paying up to £300 a year more than they need to for their energy. One of the things we've been calling for is a price cap to protect the most vulnerable, those on low income who can least afford to pay too much for their energy. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the energy industry doesn't think a price cap is the answer. The market is actually changing in quite a dynamic fashion and I think it's really important that we don't damage that and we keep competition there. We bring in some of these fantastic new entrants in the market who are bringing out innovation and challenging the big players. That's got to be right for consumers. And of course many households do shop around, eight and a half million of them in fact. And there are concerns the switchers could lose out as cheaper deals are withdrawn. There's already some evidence of that happening. Remember the competition watchdog probed this market for two years and decided ultimately a cap was not a good idea. Plus intervening in markets is unusual territory for the Tories. But if it means appealing to 17 million energy customers, Theresa May has decided the energy cap fits and she's going to wear it. Simon, thanks very much again. Simon Jack there, our business editor. A uh, quick reminder that you can find more information, plenty of detail and analysis of energy pricing uh, on a special section on our website. Uh, the address is bbc.co.uk forward slash reality check. Have a look at that and the uh, statistics are all there for you. Well, joining me now in the studio is our uh, political editor, Laura Koonsberg. Let's talk about that Labour launch today, Laura, and the, your interview there with Mr Corbyn. What did you make of the approach that he set out? Well, I think, Hugh, here is Labour's hope. We saw it absolutely today. Their aim is to make this campaign about his ideas, not his image. And you heard, you know, in that interview, him almost pleading in a way to say, when I talk to voters on the doorstep, when I ask them about social care, when I ask them about housing and explain my ideas, they think, oh yeah, I agree with that. And I think that is the approach they're going to try to take. They know that they need to get their policies across because of all the controversy there is about his personality. And tomorrow they're going to be focusing to education. Some viewers might remember back in his leadership campaign in August 2015, Mr Corbyn promised a national education service, something that he said could be on the same scale as the NHS. There'll be more information and promises on that tomorrow. They've already made a big promise about free school meals for every child in England. And I understand tomorrow they'll also promise to scrap fees for adults who go on to further education, so people who go back to college and retrain. Now, of course, that's the kind of policy that could 
could have lots of appeal on the doorstep. And I think in the course of the next few weeks, there won't be a shortage of big sounding ideas from the Labour Party. But I think they will be challenged again and again about how they'll work, of course, how they will be paid for, although they'll be trying at every step to say everything has been costed. But here's also a bit of a, an unusual thing. Sometimes in an election campaign, the problem that an opposition leader faces is that people haven't really heard of them. They're a bit of a blank sheet. They don't really know what to make of them. It's a just about punching through to the public consciousness at all. But when you talk to people inside the Labour Party, in a funny way, the problem with Jeremy Corbyn is the opposite, is that they fear that somehow people have already made their minds up about Jeremy Corbyn because of the controversial things that he's said in the time since he's been in charge. Laura, again, thanks very much. We'll talk again tomorrow. Laura Kinsberg there for us, our political editor. And by the way, later on in the programme, um, you can find out what happened when the Mays, Mr and Mrs May, appeared together on The One Show uh, on BBC One this evening. It was the Prime Minister's first joint television interview uh, with her husband, uh, Philip. And, um, well, it was interesting. We'll have a report on that later on. Now, a court in Turkey has convicted a British man of terrorism offences. Uh, Ain Davis, who's 33, was suspected of belonging to a kidnap gang that beheaded Western hostages. He was found guilty of being a member of the Islamic State group and was jailed for seven and a half years. The BBC understands that he was one of four British men, including the fighter known as Jihadi John, who guarded prisoners. Our Home Affairs correspondent Daniel Sanford reports now from Turkey. Ain Davis, posing with a fighter in Syria. Today he became the first of the suspected Beatles, the infamous Islamic State gang from Britain, to be sent to prison. At this Turkish courthouse, three judges found him guilty of being a member of IS and sentenced him to seven and a half years in jail. As he was led from court, flanked by prison guards, I asked for his reaction. He just swore at me. He's the second alleged member of the gang to be taken out of action. His friend, Mohamed Amwazi, Jahedi John, was killed in a drone strike two years ago after beheading two British hostages and three Americans. Ain Davis was captured 18 months ago at this luxury seaside villa complex 40 miles outside Istanbul. He had risked secretly crossing the border from IS-controlled parts of Syria and travelling hundreds of miles to meet up with fellow IS supporters here. But the Turkish intelligence services were watching. They moved in. And at last, one of the suspected so-called Beatles had been captured in this, the most unlikely of locations. The well-known Spanish newspaper journalist Javier Espinosa was one of the hostages held and tortured by the British men in 2014. He was released before the beheadings began but today was hugely relieved that Ain Davis was finally safely behind bars. I think he should face justice whatever it is. It doesn't matter if it's in England or Turkey or whatever. He should be in jail forever. Ain Davis is suspected to be one of the four men branded the Beatles because of their English accents by the captives they held and beheaded. The most infamous was the killer, Mohammed Mwazi or Jihadi John. The others have been named by the US State Department as Alexander Coty and El Shafi El Sheikh, both alive and still in Syria. Javier Espinosa remembers how one of the men, nicknamed George, always talked about how much he despised the West. He used to say, I hate you. I mean, it was a very common phrase that he used, we hate you. I, you don't know how I hate you. That hatred developed when all four men were radicalised in West London. Davis, a small-time drug dealer, was once jailed for having an illegal gun. Now he's serving seven and a half years in a Turkish prison for being a member of Islamic State. Daniel Sanford, BBC News, Istanbul. A man arrested close to the Houses of Parliament last month has been charged with terror offences. Khalid Mohammed Omar Ali, who's 27 from North London, is accused of preparing acts of terrorism. He's also been charged with two counts of possessing explosives related to activity in Afghanistan back in 2012. Scores of convictions, including rapes and murders, could be called into question after allegations that thousands of blood samples may have been manipulated. The National Police Chiefs Council says that forensic experts are identifying any cases which may require retesting. 
An 11-year-old girl, thought to be from Leicester, has died after an incident at the Drayton Manor theme park in the West Midlands. It's thought she was on a school visit, fell into the water from one of the rides. Our correspondent Phil Mackey reports now from the scene. It was just after 20 past two this afternoon. The air ambulance arrived to treat a seriously injured girl. Staff and paramedics tried to save her, but she was pronounced dead after being airlifted to hospital. The 11-year-old was on the Splash Canyon ride when she fell into the water. Just some close the area very quickly. The air ambulance came within a couple of minutes and then there's police, fire engines, closed the whole section of the park off after about quarter past 20 past two. The park describes the ride as wild, unpredictable and thrilling. Small boats carry up to six passengers, including children who must be at least three feet tall, on a journey that mimics fast-flowing rapids. The same family has owned Drayton Manor since it became a theme park in 1950. For 67 years, it's had an excellent safety record. This was its first ever serious accident. The grandson of the founder and the son of the current boss was visibly upset as he read a short statement. It is great sadness. Uh, we have to report a young girl has passed away at Birmingham Children's Hospital following an incident on one of our rides this afternoon. We are all truly shocked and devastated and our thoughts excuse me, are with her family and friends at this tremendously difficult time. Thank you. This is the first fatality at a British theme park in more than a decade. Staffordshire Police are keeping the health and safety executive informed about their investigations. Drayton Manor says the park will be closed tomorrow as a mark of respect to the girl's family. Phil Mackey, BBC News, Staffordshire. Now, in the past few minutes, we are getting uh, reports that the Crown Prosecution Service will announce tomorrow whether any Conservative campaigners are to be prosecuted for breaching election spending rules in 2015. Let's join our Home Affairs correspondent, Tom Simons, at Westminster. Tom, what are you hear hearing there? Well, Hugh, the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, has been working its way through a pile of files, the results of a dozen or so police investigations into these allegations of uh, problems and irregularities in election expenses from the 2015 general election. Now, the general allegation is that the Conservative Party bust supporters to marginal constituencies around the country, put them up in hotels while they campaigned for candidates in those constituencies. And and the allegation is that the cost of that was not put on the bill for the local campaign, but for the national campaign. If it had been, if it had been on the local bill, it would have taken uh, the spending allowed in those constituencies over the permitted level. Uh, that's the claim. It's an offence to do that intentionally. And tomorrow, we understand, the Crown Prosecution Service will decide whether there is enough evidence to prosecute and whether it is in the public interest for the Crown Prosecution Service to press charges. There are two tests before the prosecution can go ahead. Either way, it's going to be quite a moment because we are just a day from uh, Thursday, which is the date at which candidates can either come forward or drop out of the general election campaign. So the Conservative Party, if there are prosecutions, will have some big and complex decisions to make. Hugh. Tom, again, thanks very much for the update there. Westminster Tom Simons, our Home Affairs correspondent. Now, there's been a sharp rise in the number of migrants making the dangerous journey by sea from Libya to Europe, as we reported yesterday. The numbers attempting the crossing are already 50% higher than last year, and attitudes to this influx in Europe also seem to have been hardening. My colleague uh, Rita Chakrabarti was with some of the migrants being brought ashore in Italy uh, to face a rather uncertain future. A new day and perhaps a new life. After days on the deck of this rescue ship, it's the first glimpse of Europe for people who left the shores of Libya unsure they'd survive to see this. Trying to cross continents in these dinghies felt like their only hope, said several. Like this young Nigerian man who said he'd been working in Libya as a welder until his foot was blown off by an explosive. He preferred not to give his name. Everybody don't have a choice, nobody have a choice. There is one, even me, I think that this water that I'm going to cross, if I'm dead, is God know why. He said he couldn't return home because of Boko Haram. Now, first off the ship, he's helped to safety. 
On shore, there's chocolate and panettone for breakfast, and as people are checked and processed, a warm welcome Italian style. Where are you from? Gambia. Many look dazed. The contrast with what they've come from is stark. This is the end of the long sea journey. The injured came out <coughs> first, then women and children, and now the rest. But they're arriving in a Europe where attitudes are hardening against them. The future for many is uncertain. All humanity is present on these treacherous crossings, and the rescuers make no distinction between the persecuted and the poor. But Europe does. Existing fears about migration and the fact that over 43,000 people have arrived this way this year mean the reception they can expect will be very mixed. For those who have arrived, another journey has started. They may have reached their longed-for goal, but admission here in Europe and acceptance might still elude them. Rita Chakrabarti, BBC News in Calabria, southern Italy. The Liberal candidate in South Korea's presidential election has claimed victory. Moon Jae-in favours greater dialogue with North Korea in a change to current South Korean policy. The early election was called after a corruption scandal led to the impeachment of the former president. Official results there have yet to be released. Now, the health and safety executive is to prosecute a mental health trust in connection with the death of a teenager in Oxford. Connor Sparrowhawk, who was 18, drowned in a bath at a residential unit run by Southern Health back in 2013. Uh, tonight, the trust has apologised again to his family. Our social affairs correspondent, Michael Buchanan, uncovered the story. <laughs> he was affectionately known as Laughing Boy but Connor Sparrowhawk's love of life was cut short by NHS failures. While a patient of the Southern Health Unit in 2013, the 18-year-old who had learning disabilities drowned in a bath following an epileptic seizure. Now we've learned the health and safety executive are to take the unusual step of prosecuting the trust for failings that led to his death. Connor's mother, Sarah Ryan, told me she welcomed the news but it's a hollow victory for the family's campaign for justice. We've just been put through the mill. We have been treated appallingly and he should never have died. And I just miss him, so. Connor's death was initially put down to natural causes by Southern Health, but in 2015, an inquest jury disagreed and found neglect by the trust had contributed to his death. This prosecution could now see them heavily fined. Safety expert Mike Holder used to work for Southern Health, but he actually urged the health and safety executive to prosecute his former employers. I just felt that Connor himself should not have been left in a bath unattended. Uh, that doesn't mean you're going to have somebody there in the room all of the time, but certainly should have been under observation. It was, it was totally foreseeable that somebody with his condition could drown in a bath and he should never have been left unattended. All of us are incredibly sorry that... Following Connor's drowning, a wider review of deaths found major failures of the trust, which prompted the chief executive, Katrina Percy, to resign. In a statement today, Southern Health told us Connor's death could have been prevented, but they said significant changes have taken place since 2013 and the organisation continues to do everything it can to improve the quality and safety of services. None of it brings Connor back. No, I know. He's left an unimaginable hole in our lives, really, and he was an enormously loved, incredibly interesting, beautiful boy. He had so much to contribute that was never acknowledged. Michael Buchanan, BBC News, Oxford. Chris Froome, three-time winner of the Tour de France, says he was deliberately knocked off his bike by a car while training in southern France. The 31-year-old posted a photograph on social media of his damaged bike, but said he wasn't hurt. Team Sky say that they have reported the matter to the police. The Venice Biennale has been called the Olympic Games of the art world, an international event in which 86 countries compete to win the award for the best exhibition. Representing Britain uh, this year is Phila de Barlow, a sculptor who had to wait until her mid-60s for proper recognition. She gave our arts editor, Will Gompertz, a tour of her latest work, which is made of recycled materials, including concrete and wood. OK, Phil, let's have a look at the show. And starting in room one of the British Pavilion. Yes. And these huge totemic structures you've put in here. To me, these are about size. They're about the dimension of the space. 
Yes. Um, they're about using the dimension of the space. I like the adventure of being able to make the sculpture do what I can't do, which is to climb up into unusable parts of the space. So this piece is much more colourful in, in this room, the pillars are made out of sheets of, sheets of wood. It, it feels slightly threatening, the way it's sort of leaning yes. over t towards us, if it might fall and crush us. I think there's, I'm trying to use a lot of drama in yeah. this show. I think maybe I want the drama to almost overwhelm the, in a way, the quite ordered spaces that make up the British Pavilion. I don't want to appear in any way rude or dismissive, but if I was to describe this, mm. this seems to be your most junk-like work. Mm, yes. It looks like it's... A, um, well, it is, yes. <laughs> the, this work has a history in the sense that all these elements here are abandoned components of a work that was going to go outside, but oh. it became too difficult to use them, and it was just left as a great stack in the studio. And I started to really like it as that. Is beauty important in art? Yes, it is, but I think, I mean, maybe this sounds very pedantic. I, I think there's beauty in apparently things that have ugliness about them. To be able to reveal great beauty in things that are quite abject. Yes. I, I suppose I think I'm that kind of artist, you know, who wants to look at things that are condemned to the rubbish tip, both literally <laughs> and metaphorically, and give them a fresh start. The artist uh, Philip de Barlow there talking to Will Gompertz uh, in Venice. Well, as I mentioned earlier, Theresa May and her husband uh, Philip have appeared on the BBC's uh, The One Show this evening as part of the general election campaign effort, uh, and their aim was to offer an insight into life in Downing Street and other things besides. Our correspondent Sophie Long, who's following the Conservative campaign, was watching. Make yourself comfortable. It was their first joint television interview. This is how Theresa May decided to show voters what makes her tick. She says she believes the public should have the chance to see who they're voting for. Not in a prime ministerial debate, but on the one show sofa, with her husband by her side. I've tried to give Theresa as much support as mm. I possibly can, Matt. I think that's, that's just really important. I mean, it is, it's obviously a very tough job. There are a lot yeah. of tough decisions. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of things that you know you really have to work very hard at as PM. And I think I'm there to give Theresa as much support as I possibly can. Just the way she's, she's always given me support. Well, I was going to say, it's, cause it's, it's yeah. a two-way two two way street. Yeah. It is That's a two-way right. street, yeah. absolutely. But and traditional, nonetheless. I get to decide when I take the bins out. Not if I take the bins out. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, of There's course... boy jobs and girl jobs, you see. There's boy oh, jobs really? and girl jobs. There were no difficult political questions, and it's fair to say we didn't learn much. But this was a rare opportunity to hear from him and to see them together. I was taught by my parents is whatever job you're doing, just get on and do your best in that mm -hmm, job. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've approached everything in my career. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I was doing. But so of I, course, sorry. Well, I knew you were interested in politics, but yeah. I, I never heard Theresa say she wanted to be prime minister prime until minister. you know, mm -hmm. until she was well established in, in you know in the shadow cabinet. A small insight, perhaps, as that would mean Theresa May had prime ministerial ambitions much earlier than she'd previously let on. It was live, unscripted. They weren't told what the questions would be in advance. As with many of the Prime Minister's appearances of this campaign so far, there weren't that many voters in sight. But this one was beamed into the homes of about three and a half million viewers. And there was a rare, jovial moment about a European institution. Eurovision. Now, we're not leaving that as well, are we? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tempted to say, in current circumstances, I'm not sure how many votes we'll get. Sophie Long, BBC News. There you go. Uh, that's all from us here on BBC One. It's uh, time for the news where you are. Have a good night.